So it, it's my pleasure to introduce uh, Martha Schwartz uh, for the first lecture. Martha is an American landscape architect and professor in practice in landscape architecture at Harvard University. Uh, she has a background in the fine arts as well as landscape architecture, and her projects range from private to the urban scale. She studied at the Harvard Graduate School of Design and graduated from the University of Michigan um, and currently has firms in Cambridge, Massachusetts, London and Shanghai. So Martha, it's my pleasure to invite you. Okay, good morning everyone. I'm amazed there are so many people up at such an early hour. Uh, first of all, is it possible to turn down the lights? Um, Yes, <laughs> Greg's laughing. It'd be great, you know, to turn these lights off so you can see the screen better. And if there's somebody who is, can command the switch, in a minute, great, okay. Um, this morning, I thought we would just have some fun. Yeah, thank you. Now you can go back to sleep. No, I'll turn it off. Black was better. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's good, that's good. Yeah, thank you very much. Um, all right, so um, I got goaded over dinner last night to actually kind of talk about uh, some of my earlier work, because now that I've uh, gotten so old, um, I think that uh, some of the earlier things that I did have kind of gotten lost in the um, kind of the layers of time. And uh, I wanted to really kind of talk a little bit about uh, where um, this work has come from, my own interest in landscape architecture. Uh, my, uh, well, first of all, and before I actually start off, I want to say that the work that you're going to see, because I'm just going to show you pictures of work, uh, these are not uh, pieces that come just from me. I have not created all this work all by myself. I have worked with amazing people uh, through all these years, and it's kind of a collective effort to get a lot of these things done. The other thing is that um, I am an idea sponge. Uh, I love ideas. so. Uh, we're always playing with different kinds of ideas, and whoever in our office comes up with the best idea, that's what we do. But um, uh, when, when I went to art school, uh, there were the, uh, these brilliant artists who were doing work out in the landscape, and uh, they were called the Earthworks Artists. And they were you know, people like uh, Smithson, who we all know. But uh, they represented a whole new way of thinking about art. They were making objects in these kind of pristine natural environments that you couldn't buy. So it was not a commercial venture. You know, you couldn't buy the spiral jetty. Uh, and um, more importantly, they were works that engaged the landscape and made you see the landscape in a different way. Uh, they. Um, uh, really, as Smithson here is talking about process, they really started to uh, challenge what we think art is. But I decided that um, these landscape art projects were really, really exciting in terms of their scale, their ambition, um, the fact that they made you uh, see the, what's that light? And the they don't need to photograph me. No, 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 no. You can get that off the web page. Please, don't photograph me. It's better to see the, for, to see the images. I, I know, but look, 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 there's that big cone of light up there. Please, can I, thank you. <laughs> um, <laughs> anyway, um, I really thought that what they were doing was interesting because they were uh, allowing you to see the landscape in a new way and using the landscape as their canvas. And these were actually the bellwethers. These people were talking about, they were like the first environmentalists that made you aware that there was a landscape. I thought, you know, 
this is what I want to do. I want to go and learn how to build landscape as art. And so I um, rather stupidly uh, decided to go, uh, well, not, I can't say stupidly. I mean, these are the newer, newer people doing this kind of work. But, you know, kind of going back to what was happening in my time is that I went into landscape architecture to learn how to build big art. And I went to my, um, ch the chairman at the time, and I told him that I wanted to continue to take uh, graduate classes in art. And he asked me, he says, well, what does art have to do with landscape? And I said, well, I have no idea, because I have no idea what landscape architecture is. So I said, well, there is none. So I, I, I couldn't take any art classes, because evidently there was no relationship between the world of art and landscape. So yeah, I almost dropped out at that point, because it seemed like such a, it was so uninteresting as a profession. And of course, this is, I don't know, 80, 30 years ago now, and the landscape profession was really asleep at the wheel. And all hell was breaking loose in, in, in the art world. I mean, Chris Burden was crucifying himself to the tops of Volkswagens, and Vito Acconci was masturbating under stairs, and you know, there, all these kind of crazy things were going. But in landscape, our job was basically, number one, to service the architects, name the plants, uh, be appropriate. There was a palette of materials that was deemed to be appropriate. And also, basically, you had to be a man. So um, I, it seemed like a deeply, uh, I mean, the other thing I have to also say is that my father's an architect, and everybody in my family's an architect. So I knew that being a landscape architect was a lower form of life. <laughs> but um, um, I, uh, it's a long story, but I persevered uh, through this, uh, largely because of Pete Walker and meeting him. And uh, when I met him, and I, uh, one of the things I remember is seeing this giant Frank Stella protractor up on his wall out in California. I'm going like, what the hell? Here's a landscape architect who actually knows about contemporary art. Like, what is that? And then how can he afford that? I mean, he's just a landscape architect. I mean, anyway, so he kind of changed the paradigm for me about um, somebody who was obviously important in landscape, but also had a relationship to art. And it was also at a time where he was exploring the same idea. What does contemporary art have to do with landscape? So I spent the summer as a um, intern there. Uh, not because I thought I would be uh, hired by the SWA group, because at that point there were 120 people there, uh, not one female um, landscape architect. So I knew this was not a job interview. But I did use the summer to explore, keep on exploring the idea that landscape could be art. So fast forward, I finish up at Harvard. I graduate. I decide that, OK, well, I'm going to go get a job as a landscape architect and try to learn this. What, what it is, I was so bored out of my skull that I would come home after working in an office trying to learn to be a landscape architect, and I decided, you know what, uh, I'm going to do this front yard to our house in Boston where Pete and I live, because neither one of us would touch it, because we couldn't decide who should do it. So for three years, it was just growing weeds. And so I waited for him. He was going on a two-week trip. So I went into action. I said, OK, I'm going to do this installation. Part of the installation is that I'm going to make it out of whatever I can buy around the block in, in Back Bay, Boston. And it's got to be done by the time it gets back. So I went to the local deli. I bought eight dozen bagels, uh, went to the aquarium shop, bought some purple gravel, uh, went to the local florist, bought some purple argentums, and just, you know, it was an existing little kind of boxwood um, uh, garden. And when he came back, this is what he saw. I had kind of just prepared this, um, kind of done the garden for him. But the smart thing that really, and invited friends over for a garden party, which meant there were about, you know, 20 drunk people kind of hanging out on the sidewalk. But I invited my really good friend who I'd gone to school with named Alan Ward, who was a professional photographer. So he made these gorgeous images of this silly garden. And uh, I had a friend who was uh, working for the New Yorker, and she said, you should send this in to your magazine. So I sent it in to uh, the ASLA. 
uh, Landscape Architecture magazine. And Grady Clay decided to put it on the front cover of the magazine for some unknown reason. He decided that this cover, and I didn't design the bagels around the cover, you know, they, they, did, they kind of did that. And he asked me to write an article about, well, why bagels? So at that time, given the fact that, um, uh, you know, doing things that were appropriate and designing for every man and kind of uh, being a professional landscape architect and all this other stuff. Um, and I wrote an article saying that the bagel actually is the perfect landscape material. It's democratic. Everybody can do it. They're easily accessible. They don't need, sh need sun. They do well in the shade. You don't need to water them. And they're biodegradable. So um, this makes them a perfect landscape material. So um, it, it was a manifesto. I was, you know, and, and I did it completely poker face. And this created such anger. It, this turn, uh, because what, I mean, this magazine was all about proving to architects that we were professionals too. And, you know, we, we, you know, we needed to be taken seriously. And so people actually dropped their prescription to the um, magazine. Uh, Grady was eventually fired. And there were so many comments. I mean, you know, there's a section in the magazine called Cuts and Fills where people get to um, write about it. You, and you could landscape the Northern Hemisphere and get three people commenting on it. This one, there, it was a continuing cuts and fill section kind of for a couple of the magazines following. And people were ranting. They were, they had blown their minds. I mean, it was like, this is terrible. This is disgusting. You know, you, you, she should be ashamed of herself. I never want to be affiliated with Harvard. This is, she's in it for the money. I like that one. Um, <laughs> I was like, oh yeah, this is a quick, get rich quick scheme. Um, and, but other people were like, well, wait a minute, this is kind of cool. I mean, that a landscape could be a bagel, or that it could be funny, or that it could have content. And my point was exactly that, that a, the landscape is a cultural art form. It's many things, but it's also that. You could see the landscape like architecture, or sculpture, or painting, or poetry. It can carry cultural content. It can be funny. It can be critical. It can be political. It can be what shape you give it. Because we make our landscapes. We create them. They're man-made. And so if we're determining them, then it can be anything. It can be even a bagel. So um, that was... Uh, that kind of actually created a line in the sand. And after that, um, people started doing kind of crazy, kooky ideas that, you know, okay, now they're allowed to try something. And it, I have to say that it has um, actually blossomed in an incredible way where people, where we are now, which is a much more strengthened profession, uh, people doing am amazing conceptually heavy work, um, uh, artistic work. Uh, it, it freed us to actually be artists and to think of ourselves as people who give form. It made us look sexy. Even architects want to be landscape architects now. I mean, you know, half the people in my office, you know, are both. So, uh, and the fact that the, the visual content of what we do holds meaning for us and makes a connection to us, and that's really important. We have to connect to others in order to actually make things happen. And I think that, for me, is really important. The other thing is that um, I took the idea of the Earthworks artist, but I'm a city girl, so I wanted to make sure I brought it to the city, the same idea. So I'm gonna go through a, a few of these art installations. This one was at the Whitehead Institute in back of MIT. And again, this is a brand new building built for a genetic engineering company as part of their art collection. And it was an outdoor area, but, and this is where I began to learn about the landscape. Um, the client loved gardens, but 
the deck couldn't hold any weight and it didn't have any water and uh, it wasn't able to, they don't, didn't have any money to actually do a garden. But you need, you know, in order to do a garden, you need usually, you know, living plants which need to be watered and that needs soil too. And you have to build it to hold that. So I began to understand that although everybody loves nature, it's just lip service. They don't love it enough to pay for it. So I said, okay, no problem, we can do a garden. So this garden is what I call the splice garden. Uh, there's nothing living in here because nothing can live in here without water, without maintenance, um, without soil, without the ability to hold it up. So half the garden is based on a French um, Baroque garden that where the, these hedges are steel covered in astroturf for, so that you can sit and gaze into the Japanese Zen garden. But of course, it's a little perverse because all these plants are plastic plants and the plants are used as rocks. But it's a cautionary tale about uh, what happens if you screw up doing genetic engineering. Um, we work uh, three miles of a wall for the um, uh, Miami airport. This was interesting because the uh, citizens got so mad that they wouldn't have any access, visual access into the airport that they hired on, you know, the art squad to come and fix a, a screw up. But we understood that the wall was facing north. So the, the, no matter how much texture or color you would put on it, it wouldn't, you wouldn't see it. So we uh, created a, one detail, which were these windows that were inserted in the system where the sunlight would actually pass through them and actually create these colorful kind of windows. Um, this, this one, Ar Architect Tonica was the first architect to ever hire us on. And this is also kind of a typical landscape tale where this shopping center was a throwaway. You know, it was going to last for about 12 years anyway. But um, it was all about, it was called Rio, meaning river. It was going to be full of fountains and water. And of course, the landscape budget got eaten up. By the time it came around to doing the river or the water features, there was no money. So I explained to the client that just a great big pan of water would be terribly boring. So we made a desperate run around the ring road of Atlanta and we found a garden shop that would sell me 350 concrete frogs. And uh, we, we used that instead of the, the fountain. Um, uh, this is our Malmo Willow. There's a, a building, uh, this was for the uh, building exhibition in Malmo a number of years ago where we decided to bring our uh, Salix Babylonica, our great big weeping willow, to the fair. And uh, part of the thing is that the green stuff below it is called um, Swedish bamboo, but it's, all, it's a willow and it's used to phytoremediate the site. So it's kind of bringing the willows to the willows. Um, an installation at the Spoleto um, Festival where we chose to work on a, um, a, uh, a plantation where they had slaves and these slaves uh, um, toiled in the fields uh, uh, harvesting cotton. So this was a way of connecting the slave quarters to the fields and kind of using white and cotton as a tribute basically to the female slaves. So this was a big installation during the Spoleto Festival. Uh, this installation we did in the Ruhr Valley on the only real hill that existed there. And um, it was basically a set of instructions given to a farmer. Uh, we had to pay for the art installation by what we raised as crops. So we, we raised corn, uh, hay, and clover. And it was about power lines and the, this red line is a hallway that leads to a, the statue of Bismarck who actually consolidated the German state. And then the Ruhr Valley produced electricity so that there's the incredible electrical lines. And at the center of this intersection of power lines and this line that leads you up to the, um, to the statue was this, um, there's this um, hallway, was the center. It was kind of like um, hell. We, we, we roasted bratwurst, so on opening day, it kind of looked like it was this kind of smoky, hellish room that was a circle of black bales of hay. But the thing is, is that in order to go up that pathway, it's only one person wide. So there was always a negotiation about who, who went first and who went last. So there was always a continuation kind of, uh, of negotiation about who had the power, who was going to walk first, who was going to get out. This one is a good one. This one was actually done 
a temporary one in uh, Baron von Munchausen's garden. I didn't even know he existed. I thought it was just a made-up movie character. But uh, it was an old overground garden. We couldn't touch it, really. Um, so the idea here was that we would simply mow the grass in a grid, and at the corner, the intersection of a grid, uh, put a plinth. And on this plinth, I collected 50 garden ornaments, 25 from Germany, 25 from the United States, so that we could behold what we actually put in our landscapes, because the garden industries in both of these countries is huge, and that we use our landscape to express ourselves, especially our, our, our um, residential landscapes. This is what people put out there to represent who they are. So it was an examination of kind of like who, you know, what the culture is, what we use, what we put in our gardens, how we want people to see us, and also to kind of raise this up to a level of an art exhibit simply by putting them up on a plinth. So, you know, there's the David, there's the, there's the uh, tire with the geraniums in it, um, and uh, at the end, the, uh, the curator from the Bielefeld Art Museum was a really sophisticated guy. He came over to me and he said, he says, oh, he said well, you're, you're really a pretty angry woman, aren't you? <laughs> I said, oh, oh, I said, well, you got it, didn't you? Anyway, so these things kind of grew up into bigger projects. This was a project for, to redo the plaza at HUD. And uh, at this time, um, we were given a budget, which was to remove the existing um, kind of stone, waterproof it, and put it back for the same budget. So uh, in the US especially, we don't want to actually spend too much money, or in those days, on doing landscapes. But the idea, because this is on a uh, parking garage, and a, which is a common type of landscape, people say to me, Martha, why don't you use plants? Well, the deal is, is that if you really want to plant in the city, you actually have to pay for it, you have to dig deeper in the ground, you have to put in more steel, you have to pay for it. And also, you know, everybody has to agree that it's important. But in, in the 60s, that wasn't important. But these are made out of junk. And my uh, provenance is actually to come up through the world of development in the United States where nobody wanted to pay for anything. But I believe that if Robert Rauschenberg can pull out you know, his stuff from his garbage can and make art, that it's not a matter of materials. It's a matter of concept and your ability, your artistic abilities to actually make value out of nothing. And that's really important for us to remember that we can do something wonderful even if we don't have the financial means to do it, just because we can think. So um, these are just made out of typical signs that you see at, you know, Pizzeria Uno or Blockbuster Video. We've got a sign maker. And uh, these things just kind of float across the plaza. Now, it was very important. I, we, I, I know Breuer, the architect. And the circle was an OK form to use. So um, although Breuer's partner did see this, and he suggested that the whole thing be sunken so you couldn't see it. <laughs> Okay, working with KPF, same situation, uh, but you know, 30 years later, same, still same thing where a plaza that could not hold any trees, uh, except if you put them on a column, which I didn't want to do. I wanted to do something that was more expressive, so we kind of took the idea of the drumlins that uh, this land actually, you know, is characterized by glaciers. They're kind of drumlins, but what we did is we created these um, mounds so that we would be able to have different kinds of space on what was supposed to be basically a blank plaza. And these mounds, however, it, you know, it, we couldn't um, put any weight on the plaza, wouldn't hold up anything. So there's about 12 inches of soil that is on top of uh, blocks of styrofoam. And then we use these little jack pine trees. To, to make this. So you're always kind of fighting against um, actually a lack of interest, a lack of investment, a lack of advocacy for the urban landscape. So that, that um, in fact, it's kind of why I am in London is that the Europeans have much more um, uh, interest because they're urbanites and they know that once you build a city, you have to keep rebuilding. In America, 
uh, we thought, hey, we built our cities, eh, we're done with it, you know, yeah. But um, it turns out they need to be rebuilt. Um, this is Yorkville Park in, in Toronto. Um, we won a major award for this, 25-year uh, best project kind of thing on this one. And it's on top of a subway tube. But it's also in an area of tiny little um, buildings uh, that are kind of now boutiques. So it's a little shopping district with these little Victorian um, kind of buildings. And what we decided to do was to uh, create a series of collection boxes because the Victorians did this. And so this is a shish kebab of different ecotypes that you would find in the Canadian Shield. So, um, you know, there's the kind of the rock, the rocky garden. There's the, the uh, we blasted a stone out of a farmer's field, reconstituted it with a great big block of styrofoam underneath it. Uh, we made, you know, a, a fountain, you know, those kind of cheesy fountains that you have those strings and you drip oil down it. We did that, but instead of oil, used water. So in the wintertime, it becomes a frozen wall. It freezes. Um, we, uh, I mean, because of the nature of kind of what I first did in terms of these installations, these art installations, um, I somehow, uh, I don't know, I somehow skipped actually developing a practice in the United States. I mean, people started calling from different areas around the world. Actually, the Japanese were the very first ones who really kind of gave me work. Um, so uh, this project is in Vienna, and it's a more recent one. It's a public housing project. And in Vienna, what happens is when immigrants come into the city, they are able to choose uh, which public housing they want to go to. Now, our site was a very long, long, skinny site that kind of took up about, you know, 30 feet from one end to the other. And it included a school. But the main purpose for this space was to create an area where the kids of these different cultures could integrate, because that's what happens in the landscape. That's where social integration happens. It doesn't happen in your living room. It happens outside on the streets and in spaces. So the idea was to kind of make, from one end, when you're looking down on it, a very kind of green, um, uh, uh, green landscape. But when you're looking up from the downhill side, it's a much more kind of sculptured and uh, uh, landscape that has areas for um, performances, playgrounds, skateboarding and to create a series of different spaces where the kids could hang out. Because what happens is that you want to hang out with your own group, but still be able to eyeball what's happening with those other guys over there, too. And that's really how, how, these, how people become integrated into a new culture. So this has actually turned out to be the most favor, favorite, favored um, a public housing project. People want to live here and they want to stay here. This is our family size uh, sliding board. And then kind of lots of areas where people can sit and meet and celebrate, have performances, do whatever they want. But it still, ha it still holds together as kind of one park as well. Um, this uh, project was really the first project that I did in the UK. It was a competition um, for an area in Manchester that had gotten bombed. This is in the mid-90s by the IRA. And um, this is what the site looks like. And again, this is our urban, this is a landscape. This is our urban landscape. The landscape is everything outside the building. It includes sidewalks and streets and curbs and alleyways and on and off ramps and you know, everything that's out there is the landscape. And as you can see, most of the time, it's actually just the space in between. People don't really consider it landscape. It's not architecture. It's not worthy of design. It's just leftover space. And a lot of the landscape looks like this. So this is our site. And this bus is on a road called Hanging Ditch Road, which evidently had a ditch in it. I don't know about the hanging part. So um, the narrative about this 
project was that we were going to knit the old section of the city, which was built on a limestone outcropping, hence all this beautiful warm um, limestone and called pudding stone, with the upper level of the shopping area, which was kind of all very new and glass and granite, and weave the, these two levels together along these ramps. Uh, it, it, I, I've always liked the chutes and ladders games, and that and this kind of what this was about, and we resurrected the hanging ditch. The upper plaza, the seating was actually made out of train parts because without the trains, the industrial revolution that happened in Manchester would never have happened because they also developed the ability to distribute their goods by creating uh, a delivery system through these, these trains. But really, the fun thing about doing landscapes is creating new situations for people to be in and creating new opportunities for people to explore how they want to act and what they want to do in space. Give them freedom to, to, to kind of do what they want to do. Uh, people's attitudes about what should happen in an open space change as we change. So it's always a good idea to try to invent different ways that people could actually kind of do things. So this is the hanging ditch. Um, I realized that once I put the ditch in, I created another boundary. So then we filled it up with ste stepping stones. And then, uh, the, I mean, the stepping stones, this ditch really became uh, probably the most uh, popular place for people to be on and kids to be on. And you find, you know, boys trying to ride their bicycles on it. And, um, but what happened is that this became a poster child for urban regeneration. This was in a pretty abandoned area. And shops started coming in. People started buying uh, apartments downtown. Um, the area, this, this little square, became a poster child for how you can use open space to regenerate urban areas. And now it's, it's like a circus. It, it has to actually be overdone because redone because it had been used so much. All right, um, we, did a, we do master plans, we do competitions. This was a competition, but this one for Cork was really all about how to deal with water and the fact that uh, in global warming conditions now, Cork is going to be underwater. So our landscape was all about how to create, actually make a big sponge where um, the water would be channeled through um, uh, uh, different kinds of uh, runnels and different kinds of gutters and different kinds of water courses and, and retained. So uh, the first one was, you know, coming up with an idea for a waterfront for the more urban side and then for the, for the, uh, the, the other side was much more kind of green and getting people to the edge of the city. But here, um, we also inserted a whole system of, of water control so that when the, there were floods, that the water was actually kind of channeled and kept away from the buildings. So the idea is that uh, you know, along the waterfront, there were these kind of moving platforms that would move up and down, with simple ideas. But this one is probably the most important uh, image. And that is that we actually sculpted the landscape so that there were multiple retention ponds so that when it did flood, um, it really did stop the water and keep the water in place so that it could trickle down back into the earth without doing a lot of damage to the city. You also have to make cool places for people in the city too, but it was really kind of an integrated way of really dealing with uh, an, an environmental issue. The Abu Dhabi Corniche is a project that we worked on for a number of years. It's a four and a half kilometer stretch of beach on the very front edge of Abu Dhabi. Um, and uh, it was a huge project. It, and, uh, you know, as landscape architects, we're beginning to be, become a point of entrance into the planning and uh, visioning of some of these big projects where, um, you know, you hire on all the, your sub-consultants, which are many. Um, you put together a team that include architects and you actually go through a process of discovery kind of based on a kind of a landscape approach, meaning kind of what 
are the natural conditions there that have to be served? And then, of course, what are all the other conditions of the city in terms of um, kind of how is it attached to the city? Who's living there? Kind of how does it function? What are the functions? But uh, basically, uh, this is a very simple system of creating a series of 100 meter rooms that are divided up so that uh, these rooms could be controlled because in this culture nobody really liked each other. The Emiratis, you know, the m uh, women and children would be separated all from single men. Um, they didn't like to be near the expats and, uh, you know, the Westerners who were basically doing the work. Uh, everybody hated the Southeast Asians. I mean, it, you know, it was not exactly an ideal kind of dem democratic and kind of well-integrated culture. But I would say that the best thing that we did, there are two things. One is that we insisted that the water's edge be for everyone and be accessible. But we would create these rooms that through management you could divide. And then over time and evolution, perhaps the culture would become more fluid. But we also designed a double-decker um, promenade that uh, allowed us to put the uh, program for the beach, the changing rooms, the restaurants, the retail, underneath these decks that then held uh, roof gardens that people could actually be under shade while they were on the beach. And at the same time, protect the city from uh, flooding. So it, we basically kind of made this double-decker kind of uh, system so as to protect the city that will be flooded in a matter of about 50 years. So that's why um, actually taking a landscape approach was a good idea to this because it really uh, did a number of things. We were able to kind of future-proof the city. We were able to kind of get the buildings off the, off the, uh, the beaches. We were able to kind of create uh, promenades that connected and were in, uh, allowed people to kind of be in shade and could ride their bicycles and, and, actu and walk, which they needed. They're the fattest people on earth now. Um, and also uh, use native materials. So it was a very, very complicated project. It stopped um, when the Arab Spring started. So I don't know whether it's going to keep on going. Um, this was our... Um, um, uh, submission for the Navy Peer Competition, which sadly we lost. Uh, I maintain we should have won it, but of course one always does. <laughs> but uh, it's interesting because um, it's a piece of uh, industrial infrastructure that has been rehabilitated, but rehabilitated badly. And what ha they've done is they've stuffed the whole pier with retail which is something that you have to, we talked yesterday, you have to be careful when thinking about your waterfront that you just don't stuff it with, with shopping because the retail has become very shoddy and seedy. Um, even a, a city like Chicago is looking to be put on the map in terms of tourism. Tourism is a huge industry that, uh, that cities are really gearing up to capture. So they wanted us to kind of try to fix up this pier. Now, I mean, this... Uh, uh, shows you the orange area is really the main promenade that we're to work on. We tried to fix up the beginning of it. We weren't to touch really anything except for the amusement park and then try to do something uh, fancy on the ed end. But our idea, do I have this? I don't have the slide. Our idea was really to create a whole park that floated on the water because the pier was like three meters up from the water and you have to remember that well, just like everybody else. This was an industrial city that's now post-industrial. The water of Lake Michigan is now clean and people want access. The Lake Michigan to Chicago is now a whole new possibility. And of course it's been cut off from the city with a highway. So you're not alone in terms of kind of making these seemingly stupid mistakes because everybody's made the same stupid mistake because nobody really uh, the water was not really seen as a quality of life issue. But our, our scheme was about kind of creating these decks that floated uh, and could be parked along the edge of the piers. And that um, we created 
uh, we actually determined that uh, making the, these planks out of concrete was the most sustainable uh, way of actually building this. However, anything on the water was wood. Uh, we took out a lot of asphalt and this huge kind of neoclassical turning radius made a plaza, but also made a garden. We called it the big scoop, the, the lower part there, that was uh, an interpretive garden that would be growing native grasses and, 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 and uh, plants as you get closer down to the waterfront, but it was stacked down and it was almost like a series of rice paddies and it would be, the water would be fed from the water pumped up from the, the lake itself. So here you have the uh, amusement park that we re redid and these wooden decks actually start at the level of the, of the uh, amusement park which is 30 feet above the actual promenade. And so the idea is that the deck would connect uh, the amusement park goers down to the water and down to a whole area that would be devoted to play. So that deck was really meant as a great big playground. During the winter time, it would be a, a, a sledding and uh, skiing, or whatever you wanted to do, but really f uh, filled with snow. The end of this um, was conceived to be a community hot tub like the Blue Lagoon in Iceland, a along with a, an art installation by Ned Kahn. And then at the very end, an amphitheater that in the summertime would be a fountain with water just pumped up from the uh, lake uh, so that kids could swim with, you know, it's pretty deep there. And at the, at the winter time, it would be a skating rink. So this is our kind of our community hot tub, blue lagoon idea. <clears throat> and then in the winter time, it could be a skating rink. But the, the idea here was to create a big enough vision that people would get excited about it, and it could be done in pieces. So when you're doing these public projects, you have to, they have to be designed so that they can be done in phases. I think that's very important. Um, the one thing that they are thinking about is doing our peer pod, which would actually connect people from uh, uh, Chicago across the highway and down the Chicago River to the site. I've worked in Beirut um, with Solidaire, and we were asked to do a park. And Beirut is the least served city in terms of open space per person. And so this park was built on the rubble that was actually collected after the, the last war. And, but it's right on the waterfront. However, in this city, there's a great fear of having people gather. So we had to do a park that could be shut off and shut down so that they could control um, gatherings. So this whole green area is actually controlled by a promenade wall that could have doors that would close it down, an amphitheater. But the areas to your right and at the bottom are areas that are open to the community around it and are really filled with uh, basketball courts and uh, things for kids to play in, fountains, because it's a very young culture. So these are kind of play fountains, orchards. It has a Mediterranean climate. It's very beautiful. Uh, this kind of shows this idea where the main pathway from the downtown out to the water continues underneath this bridge or this promenade, but also the promenade has doors on it so that it was able, you would, were able to actually cut it off. But the park is divided into two green lobes so people could look at the ocean. And here's on the outside of the promenade. And here are the basketball courts. And then you're looking at the southernmost lobe, which is a very kind of gently sloping hillside, but it's still an amphitheater for looking out at the ocean. And then the northern one also is a, uh, an amphitheater for looking at the ocean, but also a performance area. And at the very tail end is a bridge that connects over the road. But the coolest place is that underneath this kind of structure is a skateboard park. This is kind of where the young kids hang out because it's really important to make sure that there are spaces for kids to play, especially the boys. They, 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 need, they need places too. 
Grand Canal Square, this is a project that uh, really is basically an homage to Daniel, and, uh, I, and I'll tell you the story about this. This is the, the uh, this is a Dublin Docklands before it became fully developed. And John McLaughlin, who was the uh, developer, said, look, we won't be able to time one minute. <laughs> OK. Uh, we, uh, we won't be able to, we want you to do this landscape first, because it's going to take a while before we can actually build the buildings. And we saw uh, what uh, Liebskin's office had uh, proposed as the um, Performing Arts Center. So because this was the most important building, it was a civic building, and because of the strength of its aesthetic, we just Liebskin the plaza. And so what we did is we took the language and we provided a red carpet that was basically a symbolic um, opening uh, uh, and, and path to the uh, theater itself, and also symbolic to opening up this whole area for development. So there are re really good stories about this. Um, this whole area is very popular. Um, Google, Twitter, um, people have moved in here. Office spaces are still working, even though there's been a, you know the economy is terrible. The restaurants are full. The hotels are full. I'm going to, since I only have one minute left, I'm going to show you things very quickly here. But I, I do, I want to get to one, I want to get to, well, we do green landscapes. This is a regeneration of a, uh, a clay quarry. Um, our client had 500 acres of land in the Pine Barrens of New Jersey. So we kind of made it an art park, um, in a, a, an organic farm and a place where artists like Saul LeWitt would come and kind of do his art. But we regenerated this whole um, despoiled clay quarry into a nature reserve. Oh, uh, yeah, okay. Blah, 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 blah. <laughs> Abu Dhabi. The, the one thing that's interesting about this is, is, again, it's on deck. So all these green forms are green walls so that there's just basically, you know, air or styrofoam underneath them with a very, very thin section so that we can really get a lot of green up, like in a, a grocery store, without using a lot of water and a lot of weight. A lot, they had a lot of energy, but we built this thing. And the idea was a protest against aluminum because they were smelting aluminum because of their geothermal energy. So we built a great big box and made the inside, we covered it with industrial aluminum. And I, have to, I do have to say this story. That's my son, Jake. He's building it. I'm like, for God's sakes, Jake, be, be careful. You're going to fall. He says, shut up, Mom. He says, that's why they don't allow women on construction sites. <laughs> it's like, oh, my God. OK, anyway, so uh, yeah, so there they are. There's the, uh, and the landscape group came out to paint it. So there it is. It's this kind of black rough box with this crystalline inside. You get into it through the museum. And you walk around the outside, but you can never get into the interior of it. But there are these holes, these kind of portals. And, but when you look into this thing, basically your eyes are fried. It just captures the sunlight. And it really, you can't help it, but it's very, very painful looking into this thing. So it's a parable about all that glitters is not gold. And the fact is, is that they're really ruining their landscape through the smelting process. So what was very nice is it also kind of really reflected the, the very crystalline and hard and harsh and beautiful kind of landscape of Reykjavik. Okay, this is the last one, I promise. Uh, this is an art installation we did at the Master's Garden last year in 2011, uh, two years ago now, in Xi'an. And we decided we were just going to build this out of whatever was in Xi'an. And what they do is they, their city is built out of this beautiful brick and these beautiful arches. They love to have these garishly kind of lit willows, which I like too. So the theme of it was the harmonious coexistence between nature and city. And I said, well, I'm not going to do that. So um, the title of this is The Harmonious Relationship Between Nature and City. 
And what we did do is we basically did a, a maze. So it's, it's a maze. And this maze is made out of brick and mirrors. And you go through hallways or archways, doorways. And the hallways have mirrors at the end of them. So this is what it looks like from the outside, fairly kind of harsh and minimal. You walk in and immediately you are then doubled. And then this is kind of when the fun starts because it turns out that uh, the most interesting thing for people are themselves. <laughs> this kind of shows this endless city, these endless doorways and these, these strange hallways. None of the hallways are parallel. Um, and you have to make a decision about where to go. There's nobody to tell you where to go, which for the Chinese is really difficult. They want to know which is the door you go to to get to some place. So it, it was, there was a lot of angst and anxiety in this thing about, well, where do you go and how do you get out? And, um, but it was really about a city, and I've always had this kind of dream about being in the Kowloon walled city. But people began to play with it. Um, we had people chasing one another. I, that was this photographer and I was, we were chasing each other. There's uh, Jake taking pictures of himself. There were some spaces you couldn't quite get through. You're too fat. But the mirrors actually made this feel like it went on and on. However, there were only three doors that would allow you to go to the very end. If you got caught up, you'd end up in a room that was completely mirrored. Then you had to kind of go back out. There were a thousand bells strung in the trees, which also added to this kind of uh, Hitchcock-esque kind of anxiety. But when you finally got there, there was a room that was also endlessly mirrored, uh, but it was full of willow trees. So you came to this kind of endless, like, um, you know, Josiah McElhenney's work, this endless kind of grove of willow trees. And then finally, uh, you were released. You got to walk out. The, through the hallways, but it was only then that you realized that this was made of one-way or one-way mirror, and that you were being watched the whole entire time. And we realized that this was actually maybe going to be a problem as this woman is standing adjusting her underpants, and people are just standing there watching her. And we thought, oh my God! And people. Well, first of all, they a lot of them were angry that they had been watched, and then they also stood. And then they watched other people. So, um, I mean, these, these guys have no idea they're being photographed. I, and this guy, look, look how sincere he looks. He's such a liar. But, and this woman tossed her boyfriend out so she could take pictures of herself in the room. And we're all taking pictures of her. <laughs> so this really was about Big Brother. But um, I didn't really talk about that too much in China. I, I wanted to go home. Thank you very much.